Hello, everybody, and welcome. So I do apologize. It seems that the YouTube link is not working. So lucky everyone who came in on the Zoom, and hopefully everybody who saw the link for the Zoom will come on here. We're recording it. We'll share the recording afterwards. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have the YouTube with the automatic replay. So it has been a Shabbos, a Shabbos of Gimel Tamos, a Shabbos of Forbringens. Many of you might even be in New York. Your family members might be at the aisle. We forbringed with our families, with ourselves. And this is somewhat the culmination of Gimel Tamos Forbringen. And this is women. This is us together with a connection to Beis Rifka as Beis Rifka alumni. And before I introduce our speaker for tonight, I wanted to share some stories that touched me and I felt impacted me that I read over Shabbos, um, stories of the Rebbe that really showed us what a Rebbe is and how the Rebbe expects us as Hasidim to be. So the first story um, was shared by Rabbi Meir Harleg, and he said that it was one of the first days of Sukkot, and he was helping the Rebbe with Lola of an Esrug, and he was waiting to bring it to people, and he overheard a conversation. He writes, you know, I was trying not to overhear, but I happen to have overheard that a chassid passed by the Rebbe and asked the Rebbe something about an operation, like a surgery that had to happen. And the Rebbe responded, I answered before Yamtif. You didn't get the answer? And the man said, no. So the Rebbe told Rebbe Harlik to go call one of the Rebbe's secretaries. And the secretary came. The Rebbe said, I gave you an answer before Yamtif. Why didn't you give it to the man? And the secretary said it was Ariamtif. And this is how Rabbi Harlik repeated it. The Rebbe said, it was Erev Yamtif for me too. In other words, it's Erev Yamtif. Of course it's Erev Yamtif, it's, it's hectic. But if this Yid needs an answer, then the Rebbe is gonna answer even if it's Erev Yamtif. And I think a lot of times we, we struggle with the juggle where somebody needs us and we have our hands full and it might be Erev Yom Tif, and it might be Erev Shabbos, and it might be 600 things going on. Um, and it was just a reminder to me that it doesn't mean we could do everything. We can't do everything. But to the best of my ability, am I trying, even when it's Erev Yom Tif, or even, you know, we just started camp and Bistro for day camp. I really tried even the first day when it's stressful, like to see, can I, can I still accommodate and speak to the best of my ability? Um, because it's Erev Yomtev for us too. And, and this is something that the, the Rebbe showed us about taking care, about transcending ourselves, about being there for the other person and the Rebbe's true and you know unique way of being that really he expects from us. Um, another story that I found really powerful in terms of impact in terms of how we could influence, but along the same lines of really feeling the other person, Rabbi Mordechai Berg said the following story that in the 1970s, there were two girls named Paula and Cheryl that were not religious and they came to experience a Shabbos in Crown Heights and they were here over Shabbos, they were hosted. And on Shabbos day, they went to 770. They wanted to see the rabbi. And they were standing right outside 770 and they saw the rabbi coming out with a whole group of Hasidim. Suddenly they got very self-conscious because they were wearing pants. And they know that religious people don't wear pants. And there they are standing with pants and the rabbi's coming out with all this Hasidim. So they tried their best to like squeeze themselves against the wall so that the Rebbe shouldn't see them. And the Rebbe noticed them and gave a warm smile, good Shabbos, to these girls in pants. And suddenly all their tension and their anxiety and everything like dissipated. They felt comfortable. And when they were discussing it afterwards, they were so taken by the warm good Shabbos that the Rebbe gave them, it really made them want to know more. And know more about this lifestyle. And they started keeping Shabbos. And Rabbi Berg says, I know the story. Today I'm a shliach. Paula was my mother. 
And again, it's the rather feeling, seeing the, these girls' discomfort, noticing that they might be uncomfortable, feeling out of place, and just disarming them with a smile, making them feel comfortable, getting into the other person's feelings and, and kishkas and, and seeing how we could really be there for them in, in their moment of discomfort. That's the second story. And I'm going to share one more um, that I really, you know, along this line of, of love and, and Aves Yisrael that the Rebbe taught and personified to us. There was a Yemeni boy. His name was Sha'ul Jubani. He was a Bachar in Tem Chet Mimim in Lod. And he once had the opportunity to come to the Rebbe. And he came into Yechidas and he said like a Shechianu with the accent. And then he poured his heart out to the Rebbe. He had an eight page letter. He spoke about being an orphan and he spoke about his challenges. And the Rebbe told him he could speak openly. And he said to the Rebbe, you know, there's something that makes me very uncomfortable in Chabad and it's Fabringens. And you know what makes me uncomfortable? What makes me uncomfortable is everybody's trying to shove mashka at me and I don't like to drink mashka. They make me feel there's something wrong with me. I don't want to drink. L'chaim and l'chaim. It makes me, it makes me very uncomfortable. I can't enjoy this experience. And the rabbi asked him, what do you like to drink? And he said, Coca-Cola. And he says, the rabbi laughed. <laughs> Zinta laughed. The rabbi laughed. And the rabbi said, so make l'chaim and Coca-Cola. Don't get angry. Don't take it to heart. Tell whoever bothers you that I said you can make l'chaim and Coca-Cola. Not just that. The Rebbe opened his drawer, took out some dollars and said, you know, you're a bachar in yeshiva. You probably don't have money for Coca-Cola. Here. And this shawl says later, he says, I was so inexperienced. I didn't realize when the Rebbe hands you money, you take it. He says, I felt so bad. I said, no, 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 no. And I... I left it by the Rebbe. But this line, I couldn't get over it. You don't drink mashka, Coca-Cola, it's Miklachaim and Coca-Cola. I don't need to impose and force the way that I see the right way. I can work with you in the way that you're comfortable. You want to drink Coca-Cola out of Fabringen? Drink Coca-Cola out of Fabringen. The main thing is you're at the Fabringen. The main thing is you're saying Lachaim. The main thing is you're growing in your Yiddishkeit. The main thing is the Rebbe caring for this Bachar who feels a little bit different, a little bit out of place. So whether it's somebody with an operation, a girl in pants, or a Bachar that likes to drink Coca-Cola, when we're connecting to Gimel Tamas, when we're writing our pan and we're, we're strengthening our Eskashras and we're strengthening the entire Avay that the Rebbe wants from us in bringing Mashiach, it's, it's remembering that part of connecting to him is is how we connect to each other, is how we connect to fellow Yidin, how we connect to fellow Hasidim. Do we make them feel uncomfortable? And if we do, it might be something that we're not even conscious of it. It's something we need to work on. And it's these little tiny tidbits and practical stories that slowly build and shape, at least for me in my mind, you know, what type of life does the Rebbe expect from me? What type of sensitivity do I need to pick up? How could I try to accommodate somebody else. So on that note of Avas Yisrael and sensitivity and kindness, um, I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. And she's going to focus a little bit on the Rebbe's approach, not just on how to not be hard on other people, but how do we also not be hard on ourselves? How do we grow from the moment, right? It was called Rebbe, but I feel guilty. How do we not do what we typically are very good at, which is beating ourselves up unnecessarily? How do we approach challenges or those, any, you know, those voices in our head that are just so self-defeating and so negative? And how do we really work on ourselves so that we see the best in ourselves and ultimately in other people? So it's a privilege to introduce a Bishrafka alumna, Rachel. Hi, take it away. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, special, special group of Beis Rifka alumni and 
friends of Beis Rifka alumni. Really a pleasure to be here tonight. So my name is Rachel Holtzkenner and I'm talking to you from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, I want to start off tonight's sheer and far bring in with a story that happened about that happened to me about eight years ago. There was a girl who was introduced to my family and our Chabad house shortly after her sister unfortunately took her own life. Shortly after, like a week after. And she was in a terribly tormented place. And by uh, somebody told her brother about the Friday night dinners that we have uh, at that time weekly for young professionals. At that time, it was in our house. And she came with her brother. And she kept coming for many, many weeks. She brought friends. And slowly, she and, and her good friends became a lot closer to Yiddishkeit until they they fully committed to observing Tyra mitzvahs and they both married wonderful husbands. One, one of my friends, one of these girls' name is Beth. She's, I'm sorry, that's my phone. She's the, the, um, she's the who, whom the story is about. And her, her friend, Jerrica, who also became from, and today both have Baruch Hashem, beautiful from Chabad families. After they were after they were already from and married, I took them, these two girls, Beth and Jerrica, along with some other girls from my, my community, to a Shabbos in Key Largo. And this is a special Shabbos that many of you probably know about, the snorkel and study Shabbos with Rabbi Manus Friedman. It's actually longer than Shabbos. It's a whole week, but we just went for Shabbos. And they were not college students, but still, there's so much to learn from, from Rabbi Friedman's shirim and whoever else joined, whoever else was teaching there as well. So a group of friends and I went, and on Shabbos morning, I was sitting alone, and I was talking to one of the students, and she mentioned to me that her mother passed away. And I, I said to her, wow, you're such a young girl to to lose your mother, that's so so tragic. And she said, yeah. And then for some reason I said, how did your mother pass away? And she said, are you sure, are you, sure you wanna know? And I said, yeah. So she said, well, actually my brother shot my mother, she told me. And you know, of course I was shocked. I remember like literally holding onto the table because I was so shocked at that moment. Um, and she proceeded to tell me the tragic story of how her parents didn't have children until they were later in maybe in their early 40s. And they finally had herself and her brother and her younger brother suffered with mental illness for many years. And uh, her mother took care of her brother. And um, no matter how much her mother did for her brother, he was still very resentful towards her. And ultimately, when this girl was out of the house, down the block buying something at the store, her brother took out a gun and shot his mother. And uh, then she came into the house to see his mother had passed away. Hang on one second, I just wanna get my phone so I could turn the ringer off. Okay, so I was listening to the story and I said to her, okay, there we go. I said to her, would you, can I introduce you to my friend who has a similar story of a sibling with mental illness and, and tragic death in the family? And she said, sure. Of course, I went to Beth first and I asked her if that was okay. And Beth said she, would, she wanted to meet this other girl. And we made up to meet on Shabbos afternoon after lunch. And I asked the two of them, I said, can I join the meeting? And they said, sure. And I was listening like a fly on the wall to their conversation. And 
one of the things that they had in common was the sense of shame. And they were both saying that when they walk into a room, they feel so ashamed at the at what happened in their family, their respective situations. And they feel like everybody must know. There must be a sign written on my forehead saying, my sister killed herself. My brother killed my mother. And they walk into a room even though nobody knows, but they still feel a tremendous sense of shame. And um, at that point, or at some point, I interjected and I said, you know, I could understand how you would feel that way, but I just want to tell you from, an, from me, a bystander sitting here listening to you, I have the utmost respect for you both that given the tremendous challenge that you endured, you not only kept going on with your life and trying to live your best life, but you also found Hashem in your life, found Yiddishkeit in your life, made really hard changes on behalf of your neshama and your relationship with Hashem. And like, I'm in awe. I, I can't, you know, I bar Hashem don't have those challenges and I don't push myself as much as you. So all I can say is I stand in absolute, complete respect of you and your life's path, both of you. And uh, shame is feeling me looking at you and feeling ashamed of you is like the exact opposite of what I feel. But that story taught me a lesson that so many of us carry with us a lot of shame. Some of it, like in their situation, which is completely not justified because they did nothing but positive actions in, in their situation. And sometimes maybe there is a little justification for the shame, at least in our minds. And what does that do to us? And how does it affect us and impact us in a negative way? And this is something that Chassidus talks about, Tat talks about in the Tanya. And today we're going to learn and farbring about a letter from the Rebbe written to a woman who said just that, that she felt guilty and perhaps ashamed at her characteristics or maybe mistakes that she made. I'm going to post this letter right here in the, in the chat. So if anybody wants, you can open up the letter so you will have the letter in Yiddish and English. This was prepared by Arva uh, This whole workshop, I worked on this workshop with Arva and And for those of you who've been following Rabbi Shays Taub's um, classes, this is one of the letters that he taught. <clears throat> so... If you don't want to open up the doc, that's totally fine as well, because I'm actually going to read through the whole letter and then we're going to discuss it. So here goes. The letter starts off, Baruch Hashem Tezayin Elul Tuf Shin Yud. So we're talking about 1950. We're talking about a few months after the Frida Karebis Histalkos. Maras blank Tichia. We don't know who this letter is written to. Bracha V'Shalom. And the Rebbe starts off. I received your letter from Chav Zayin Menachem of in Velcha Erba Shreit Ayra Matav un Baklaktzich as a felt Eich in Gutzkeit und Frumkeit. You write about your situation and that you are lacking in goodness, decency, perhaps, and from kite, being from piety. This is the only part of the letter that the Rebbe quotes. Perhaps the writer, the woman, wrote more, more details about her situation, of course, but about why she felt that she was lacking in goods kite and from kite. But the Rebbe, so to speak, clipped this core line and is now going to address it in the rest of the letter back to this woman. And before we learn the Rebbe's response, I want, I want to, to encourage everybody to take a minute to think about if you were writing the letter, maybe, and, and think about maybe a, a day of where you feel particularly weak, what would you write? 
maybe it wouldn't be as felt in Gutskeit and Frumkeit. Maybe it would be, I'm lacking in being a functional mom, lacking in being a good communicator, being a confident person, being organized, being self-disciplined. This is who I am. I am lacking in these core areas. Rebbe, I'm coming to you, an open book, transparent, but my assessment of myself is that I am not good enough. I am lacking. What would you expect the Rebbe to answer? We know the Rebbe is going to answer with compassion. That goes without saying. But where is the Rebbe going to take this? Conversely, if somebody came to you, maybe in writing or more likely in person, and said, you know, I, I'm not a good person. I'm not a nice person. I'm not a from person. Where would you go with that? Where would you steer the conversation? What do you think would be the most constructive, empowering way to give this person a path to, uh, towards more positivity? If it was me, I would maybe say, oh, that's probably your Yetzirah talking. But we'll see in this letter, the Rebbe doesn't mention the word Yetzahara even once. So again, just to personalize it, I'm coming to the Rebbe. If you'd like, I'm gonna encourage you to think I'm coming to the Rebbe right now. And I'm saying Rebbe on some days or every day, I feel like I feel really guilty or I feel like I'm not good enough in these areas. I think Hashkacha Pratis, that this is written by a woman. Maybe it, would, it could have been written by a man as well. But I think as a woman, we're, as women, we're maybe even more prone to just waking up in the morning and feeling like, I know I've done something wrong. I don't know what it is, but I already feel like I've done something wrong today. I feel guilty for this. I feel guilty for that. We have a laundry list of things that we feel guilty for. And sometimes that's our biggest Yetzirah, is getting rid of the self-deprecating thoughts so what's the path to take? What are some ways to push back on those feelings? Where is there a place to take them seriously and say, okay, well, let me do something to improve so that I don't need to have these bad assessments of myself. Let's see where the Rebbe takes it. So we don't know if this woman was writing her assessment of herself because she was writing close to Chaydish Elo, she was writing, she wrote in Chav Zayim and Achamav. Maybe she would have written the same thing in Chaydish Adar. But the Rebbe takes the theme of Chaydish Adar, which is when the Rebbe responds, as the initial template to respond to her words, or at least the part of her words that the Rebbe feels are the most important and must be addressed. And the Rebbe writes, and for the rest, I'm going to do it all in English, even though it's a letter in Yiddish, except for one more line that I'll read in Yiddish. But again, please feel free to, um, to open up the letter on your phone or at a later time, if, or on your computer or any time to, to learn it inside. Here we go. The Rebbe says, in Hasidus, and this is also cited in a mimer of my revered father-in-law, the Rebbe Hakam, it is stated, that in Elul, Hashem is like a king who goes out to the field. There, everybody can approach him. And there he accepts everybody with a pleasant countenance and a smile, regardless of the situation of the man or woman who approaches him. In the Nimshal, in the month of Elul, the last month of the year, when we undergo spiritual stock taking for the entire previous year, a person does not have to be afraid when he thinks over all his actions in the previous year. We tell him, you should know that even though you are in the field and don't know whether it's befitting to allow you to enter a place where, where eminent people live, you should nevertheless approach the king of kings who has come out to you in the field. And there you can immediately approach him with your request and he will accept you with a pleasant countenance and a smile. Therefore, you have no reason to be afraid. Even though the outcome of the spiritual stock taking you made of your deeds, speech, and thoughts is not positive, since you are dealing with a merciful father 
If you make a resolution that from now on, everything you do will be as God wants, you will surely receive a kasiva v'chasima toiva, a good and sweet year, both for the body and the soul. And this concludes the part of the letter where the Rebbe brings in Chodesh Elul. So just to point out a few things that I found so, uh, so interesting here, the Rebbe is almost giving her a stamp of approval for her negative self-assessment. The Rebbe is saying, okay, that was perfect. That's, that's what you're supposed to do in Elul. In Elul is when we undergo a spiritual stock taking. That's good. So you did it. The only thing we need to stop, we need to put our brakes on fear. The Rebbe doesn't call it guilt. The Rebbe calls it fear. Meaning being as though I'm lacking in these areas, uh-oh, what's going to happen next? Who is going to reject me? How is life going to bring me negative things? because of what I've done. And the Rebbe says, no, 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 that part is not appropriate. The spiritual stock taking, okay, it's Elul. But the fear, no, the fear is not appropriate. What, what comes immediately after the spiritual stock taking is the opportunity, the opportunity to be greeted by the king who's there with me in my place of deficiency. And especially, this is my words, or it doesn't say this, especially if the result of my spiritual stock taking is going to be a resolution. Even better, the Avishter loves positive resolutions. I was motivated to make a positive resolution because of my negative self assessment. So now I'm in a perfect state, a perfect situation to be embraced by the king. The king is in the field. I just made a positive resolution. The king is giving me his most beautiful smile. This is, this is the place to go next, is what the Rebbe says for her. Reminds me of a story that I heard from Rabbi Manus Friedman recently about a Balas Chuva who wrote to the Rebbe about um, different things that she was involved with before she was from, and she felt like she couldn't be she couldn't whitewash that. And they were like her demons, her skeletons in the closet. And she felt even though now she was leading a from life, her, old, her past life was coming to haunt her. And she wrote to the Rebbe a very, very detailed letter, spilling her guts, you know, confession, writing everything that she had gone through uh, and that she had done, all the mistakes that she had made, of course, not to her, not that, she, not that it was her fault, but she wrote all of this to the Rebbe. And Rabbi Freeman says that the Rebbe responded with two words. Tshuva seich niskabel. Your tshuva was accepted. And, and that was it. Like, you don't need to go do tumble salts and torture yourself or even live with it anymore. That's it. You said what happened. You let it, you, you, you admitted what happened. And it is over now. And what a healthy attitude that is to be able to, so to speak, release the trauma and then move on. Unfortunately, I know for myself, I'm not very good at leaving my guilt in the past and moving on. Even after I've done everything I could to try and rectify the situation in the past, I'm still judging myself for what I did and turned off by myself, disgusted with myself for things that I've done. And um, I know I'm in good company because we know that the Alta Rebbe spends a lot of time, spills much ink talking about how we can push back on feelings of guilt. The Alta Rebbe calls it Mariros Mimiloi de Alma. And in two and a half Prakam of Tanya, half of Perkavov, Perkav Zion, and Perkav the Alta Rebbe addresses Atzvos Mimiloi de Alma from all angles, telling us the very specific and narrow uh, circumstance when thinking negatively about ourselves is helpful. Now, Valder Rebbe spends half a parak talking about how to stay happy when negative things happen to us. That's, I'm sorry, I think I said it wrong. That's Atzbus Mimilo de Alma. The Alter Rebbe spends two and a half prakim talking about how to stay happy when I'm thinking about 
what a bad person I am. And that's Atzlus Mamilu Deshmaya. So think about the balance. Half a parak encouraging us to keep happy and keep strong, even when we're disappointed by how our life is going. And two and a half prakking teaching us how to keep strong when we're upset at ourselves. And there's many reasons that have been offered for why the altar of spends more time talking about how to push back on guilt. But one approach perhaps is that it's harder to cut the umbilical cord on feelings of guilt. Because in our mind, we know, it's from Hashem. I need to let it go. It's hard, but I need to let it go. But how can I let go being turned off by myself for the things that I've done wrong? I don't feel okay letting that go. I feel like that itself is a crime. And so we need maybe more coaxing to give us permission to let go of those negative feelings that are coming to haunt us, coming to bring us down and not coming to empower us. When is it appropriate to have those feelings of guilt? Valter Rebbe says, gives a few conditions and criteria. One of them is the itim mizumanim, when I set times for myself. Not when the thoughts come to plague me, stam in the middle of the day, but when I make a time for myself to think about it. Somebody mentioned to me that the Rebbe, the Rebbe went even further by encouraging people to push off feelings of guilt and find another excuse to push it off and another excuse to push it off until you actually never get around to really sitting and, and digging into yourself. But another differentiation between that constructive self-criticism, which the Altarva calls marirus, and the destructive, disempowering feelings of guilt and shame called atzvos, is that one is energizing. Okay, my house is a wreck. I'm gonna reorganize everything. And one is very draining. Like I can't even wash a dish because I am just so overwhelmed by how much I need to clean. And I'm so turned off by my organizational skills and my housekeeping skills. And I'm comparing myself to other people who never have dirty dishes in their sink. So, once it's draining, it's probably not going to be constructive. Those thoughts are probably not going to be constructive. That's the Yetzahara coming to rob me of my confidence, my simcha sachayim, and instead shift my focus to what I've done wrong. Here in this letter, the Rebbe is encouraging this woman twice, once we already did and once we'll see again, to make a resolution to do better. And that could have been the whole, the whole letter of the Rebbe. You feel like you're lacking in goodness and in frumkeit, make a resolution to do better. But we'll see, and you've seen already that in most of the letter, the Rebbe is encouraging her to hold on to her thoughts of Hashem's unconditional love for her. And as we'll see in a minute, the Rebbe's unconditional love for her. In addition to mentioning her to her, how valuable it is to make a resolution to change. Next point that the Rebbe makes. In particular, a woman who has raised children who are following a righteous path, the path of Torah and the path of Chassidus, should feel encouraged, for this is one of the greatest merits that a woman can have. This will help you emerge from your present undesirable situation and lead you onto the proper path to benefit from material, material and spiritual goodness. So the Rebbe is telling her that you did something really, really good. You raised a family, you raised children who are now from and they're Hasidim. That's incredible. You did something excellent. And I'm going to read this line in the Yiddish also. Vastos is einer von die greste zuchusim vasafroi kenhoven. What a schos. It's interesting because a lot of times as women, we think when our children do something good, that's my reward. That's the Abishter's bracha to me. I can't take any credit for this. I made so many mistakes. I feel so lucky that the Abishter granted me a child who's choosing to do good with their life or who chose to do something good today. And here the Rebbe is giving this woman and, hope, and, and all of us 
even more credit than we like to take for ourselves. That this is my zahus, that I can, you, the Rebbe is saying, should be proud of something that you did, a positive contribution that you made. You see your children today, they're from, that's because of you. And hold on to that. Let that balance out the negative assessment that you made of yourself, because that's really big. That's really important. And um, we don't like to do that. We don't like to take credit for our children's good behavior a lot of times because maybe we think, oh, that's being too arrogant and it's really not because of me. But sometimes maybe the Rebbe is saying, you need it, especially when we're feeling vulnerable. Look, look at what you did. Can you even imagine the impact that you had on that child and their children? and all the people that they will impact in a positive way. Hold on to that. Breathe that in. Allow yourself to feel good about that zuchus, that positive impact that you made. And maybe we can even globalize that a little bit more uh, to anything that we've done to impact another person or to impact the world. When I weigh my ugly character, whether I'm right or not, okay. But when I weigh that against something tangible and concrete that I know I've done, that's made a positive impact in the world, and I know that every positive impact has ripple effects, hold on to that, because that's something that's empirical, that's tangible, that's something that I know for sure is going to make the world a better place. And that, fuels me, and this I think is the main point, that fuels me to go further with the confidence that I could make it, that I could make a positive impact going forward. And that outweighs the ugly character characteristics that I feel that I have or the mistakes that I've made. Okay, you've made mistakes. Try to make a resolution, make a resolution. But the Rebbe is saying, keep this peace in mind. You've done a lot of good as well. And now we're going to move on to the last part of the letter. And again, I know for those of you who were following Rabbi Chase Taub's um, classes, whether it was the 30 letters in 30 days, or these, I think it was five letters that, the Reb, that, that Rabbi Chase Taub taught, um, a lot of times he'll say, the Rebbe could have stopped there. And you know what? The Rebbe had a lot of letters to answer. And it would have been it would have been more time efficient for the Rebbe to you know, answer and buy the next letter. But the Rebbe flushes things out in such, a, in such an explicit way, really, really to, um, to close all holes uh, in our mind, in our mind that naturally you know, needs a lot of coaxing, needs, needs a lot of scaffolding, buttressing the idea so that we're really confident in taking it to heart and holding it. So the Rebbe could have spoken about Chodesh Elul enough. The Rebbe could have said, also remember your children and what the good that you've impacted them enough. But here the Rebbe goes one step further and concludes, and this part, uh, which... Uh, is all even uh, most relevant perhaps to Gimel Tamlus because it's talking about Askashrus. And here the Rebbe says like this, I'm just gonna pull up this paragraph from my phone. The Rebbe says, we must all know we had a great Rebbe and we currently also have a great Rebbe, my esteemed father-in-law, the Rebbe. He requested and begs and begged and he currently also requests blessings and success for every Jew in general and for those who are connected to him in particular. Okay, the Rebbe goes on. The Rebbe knew and knows of the weaknesses that exist amongst the men and women of the Hasidic Brotherhood. Nevertheless, without paying attention to that, he prayed for them. And he prays for them, for what they need in general, in the general categories of health, children, and sustenance. And that Hashem should forgive their sins 
taking into consideration the circumstances in which they are found and the challenges of the Yitzhahara. Therefore, we must make a firm resolve that from now on, we will conduct ourselves better. This is the second time that the Rebbe speaks about making a resolution. This resolve will draw down blessings and success so that we and you and all the members of your household are included in this general grouping. We all have a good and sweet year. Everyone will have the desires of his heart for good. We will be from, and as a result, goodness will be manifest in both material and spiritual matters. At an appropriate time, I will remember all those whom you mentioned in the letter at the gravesite of my revealed father-in-law, the Rebbe Hakam, for blessings and for a kasiva v'chasima toiva for a good and sweet year. Certainly, you will be able to inform me of good news concerning you and your entire household. So the Rebbe says, <clears throat> I want to tell you something else that's going to reshift, reframe the negative headspace that you're in right now. And that is that you have an advocate. You have a lawyer. You have somebody that is rooting for you. And that is the Rebbe. And the Rebbe is writing this after Yud Shvat Tov Shin Yud. So the Rebbe goes on to say that the Rebbe knew, the Rebbe emphasizes the Rebbe knew and knows the Rebbe prayed and prays still happening. And that the Rebbe knows his chassidim very well. He knows exactly who his chassidim are, what their struggles are. And that doesn't take away one iota from his feeling that these are, these are the people that the Rebbe is here to bless, to bench, to ensure have what they need for their success. And what's the Rebbe doing? Is the Rebbe looking at you with a critical eye saying, I wish I can give you more, but I can't because of how, because of the negative choices that you made, because of your characteristics. The Rebbe is painting a very different picture here. The Rebbe is the one who is being Malamed's hus, is your lawyer when the Abishter is looking at you. The Rebbe is there telling the Abishter, no, no, no. Think about all their challenges and all their circumstances. This is what led them to make these mistakes. Hold that picture, that accurate picture of the Rebbe in your mind. You who are writing to me as your Rebbe, let me explain to you a little bit more when she was not writing to him, perhaps as the Rebbe. I don't know if she was writing to the Rebbe as the Rebbe because it was before the Rebbe took on the Nisias officially. But you're writing about the Rebbe and this is what a Rebbe is. If you know what a Rebbe is, it will A, lift you up from your sad matzav, even though your reflection, your self-reflection is, is shameful, is embarrassing. And it will also motivate you in this resolution that I'm encouraging you to make. It's interesting because I think a lot of times we think that the unconditional acceptance is a stira, is a contradiction to motivating people to change. If I love you just the way you are, then why would you need to change? And here the Rebbe is painting a picture, the Rebbe is explaining to us the Rebbe's, the role of a Rebbe and holding both things up simultaneously. That the Rebbe loves unconditionally. The Rebbe looks not to be critical of us, but to be Malamed's chus by taking into consideration all of the challenges that led us to make our mistakes. And this itself motivates me to make a positive resolution. And although it sounds, it sounds like um, counterintuitive that the two should go together, but I think that we see this all the time, especially for those of us who are in the world of Chinuch, and we're all in the world of Chinuch as parents and friends and grandparents and aunts and uncles, that what is going to provide a child with the 
the most powerful template to be from, to enjoy Yiddishkeit, to be open-hearted and receptive to all of the inspiration available for them, their teachers, their counselors, to make good choices. It's the safe adult. It's the adult that believes in them. It's the adult that's looking to see the positive that they're doing despite all the negative that they may be doing. And that's us. And that's a very hard role to play. But at the moments perhaps that we feel like, how could I advocate for this child? They don't deserve it. They deserve to be shown, you know, the natural consequences of their behavior. Really? The Rebbe doesn't view it that way. Why would I? And the more I show this person, this child, this adult, that I believe in them, that I understand where they were coming from, the more I'm motivating them to take a step in the right direction, to believe in themselves, to believe that change is possible, to believe that a resolution is part of their identity and who they are. I want to conclude with a story that for me embodies the idea, one of the points, one of the nakudas from this letter, both in terms of the mashal of HaMelech Basada and in terms of this gashros. And by the way, when I read this letter, my, my first thought was, oh, so the Rebbe is the Melech Basada and not just in Chaydash Elo. Every single month of the year, the Rebbe doesn't go back into his palace and then become inaccessible in Chaydash Tishrei. The Rebbe is Chaydash Elo. He's both in the palace and in the field at the same time, there with the people in the field and the people in the palace. And every time that we're turn towards the king, turn, turn towards the Rebbe, he's makabalos even more so, v'sever panim yafos. Or to put in a more a typical lingo, he has so much nachas from the fact that we took advantage of, his, of the Rebbe's unconditional love and belief in us by doing something that will maximize our life, our personal shlichus. So in that vein, I wanted to conclude with a story. And um, as Sarah said, I had the great privilege to go to Beis Rifka for high school. And uh, when I entered into high school in ninth grade, it was a few months after Chav Zayin Adar Tav Shin Nun Beis. And um, for that first year that I was in ninth grade, um, as well as the next year. It was a very tumultuous time for those of you who were in high school with me. You remember, um, we had a lot of assemblies and the Anhala was always begging us to do everything that we could for the Rebbe's Rafur Shalema. And um, also when the Rebbe would come out to the balcony for Mincha, very often the entire school would leave and would, we would go to 770, especially in the winter when Mincha is so early. Well, this, um, this story happened not by Mincha, but by my roof. And I was already home, I was boarding by a wonderful family, Yisrael and Sarah Yarmosh on Montgomery Street. And, um, Rabbi Yisrael Yarmush told me, Rachel, I just got a message on my beeper that the Rebbe is going to come out to the balcony for my roof. And I was thinking to myself, should I go or should I not? Because it wasn't such a novelty that the Rebbe would come out for Minhar my roof. And I said, you know, I decided that I was going to go. So I walked to uh, 770. And when I got to 770, I, I saw that the Rebbe was tacking in the balcony, but the curtains were closed. For those of you who are not familiar with how this worked, uh, the maskirim would bring the Rebbe in the Rebbe's wheelchair to the balcony, but would not open the curtains 
until the Rebbe would motion that he was ready for the curtains to be opened. And sometimes we knew that the Rebbe was in the bal sitting in the balcony, but did not yet give the sign for the curtains to be opened. And I was very, it was very frustrating when that happened because it was like, you know, so, so close, but so far. So when I came to 770, that was a situation. And I don't know how long that that had been going on for. I don't know if, you know, 15 minutes earlier when, when um, Rebbe Stroll Yarmush got the beeper, I don't know if the Rebbe was already, already um, in the balcony or not. Probably many people here know better how long that could have gone for. But I came and I saw everybody was singing and not just singing, really, really yearning to see the Rebbe and uh, frustrated that they didn't, they, they weren't seeing the Rebbe yet. And I had um, this feeling at that moment um, that I, I really want to do something to, um, to, to, to help the Rebbe be more connected to us or in a way that we could see. Um, so I closed my eyes and I did like a chesh ben hanefesh. And I knew that the, my biggest vice or at least in my, that I thought was my biggest vice at the time was my addiction to reading novels. If probably if I was a teenager in uh, 2022, it would be my addiction to my smartphone or to Netflix or whatever it is. But for Hashem, I didn't have that challenge when I was a teenager. So this was my addiction. And um, it was a big, you know, it was a big part of my life. And I closed my eyes and I said, Rebbe, I am not going to read those novels anymore. And um, when my eyes opened, at that moment, the curtains started to open from the balcony and, um, and we were able to see the Rebbe. And uh, there could have been a hundred or a thousand reasons that that was the exact moment that the Rebbe wanted the curtains to be open. But to me, to little me, it made a very, very big impression that what I do is very, very important to the Rebbe, very much noticed and impactful. And it was such an important moment that until today, I still kept to that resolution I don't think I've ever had a resolution that I've kept since I was uh, 15. Um, but that, that's, how, that's how deeply that moment touched me. So before we look at some of the questions, I just want to conclude this uh, main body of this letter and Fabringen by benching everybody with the ability to look at those feelings of guilt and being disgusted or turned off by ourselves or feeling less than and opening up a window of possibilities that maybe I don't have to let that drag me down every single day or today. Maybe there's another way to look at it. And maybe there's a more Hasidic way to look at it. Maybe there's a way that the Rebbe would want me to look at it. And I think in this letter, the Rebbe is saying that actually knowing how much the Rebbe loves you is itself freeing. You think that knowing how much the Rebbe loves you would make you feel more guilty. Might as well just be afraid to get into that relationship again or ever. But actually, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid at all. The Rebbe is there for you for every single challenge that you have in your life and in your personality. Is not looking at you with a critical eye, but in the, in the, the opposite, being malamed spos, and there to give you brachas and help and chizuk, and so appreciative of all of the positive resolutions that we can make little by little, 
perhaps in baby steps, perhaps sometimes in big steps. And the Mir Tashem, all of our resolutions, A, to have a more Hasidic mindset about our own self-assessment and a Hasidic mindset about any area in life where we could allow it to seep in, all of that and the power of the Noshim Tzedkaniyais will definitely have a tremendous impact and be the last push until the full revelation of Mashiach. May it be now, tonight. Thank you so much. Okay, Rachel, so for those- Rachel, yeah. Um, sorry to put you on the spot, but some people sent in questions. Can I ask you questions? Yes. So first of all, you shared absolutely beautifully and eloquently. So first a tiny like personal question, what's your maiden name? Somebody wants to know. My maiden name is Estreifer. <laughs> okay, hi. So there we are. So somebody wants to know like this, the Rebbe's letter was beautiful and it was really empowering, inspiring, but there was one bit that was hard to swallow. And that part was that the Rebbe was basically encouraging the woman to take credit and feel good for our children that turned out okay. So the question is, if we take credit for their good behavior, then do we take blame for their bad behavior? That's very painful for someone whose children didn't choose the proper way. And, and that, you know, is so rampant today. 100%, 100%, such a, such a painful question and such an obvious question that I think, in fact, when um, when we were looking over the letters with Orva Chaim, Iti Shem Tov and the people that are in charge, that, that was one thing that we were a little bit hesitant to, to, um, to mention actually, um, not to mention, I'm sorry, we were, we were hesitant about whether to use this letter as the basis of the Fabrengen for this and for other reasons that this could be a trigger. So, um, so I think what you're saying is, um, I think the question is, is a very valid question. So of course, who am I? I don't know the answer to that question, but I think that the Rebbe comes off across so strongly to this woman that it is incorrect to judge yourself critically. She's saying straight out, she's not guessing. Maybe my children's negative behavior is because of me. She's saying straight out, I'm not a good person and I'm not a firm person. She lucked out with her kids. <laughs> but who knows if her assessment was even correct, you know, was even, uh, was even based on, on something tangible, whatever it is. And the Reb is saying, that's not, don't hold on to that. That's not, that's not correct. That's not the way the Abishter looks at you. And that's not the Rebbe, that's not the way the Rebbe looks at you. So I would say absolutely not holding on to, to, um, to that type of blame is, is the worst type of obstacles. It's very difficult, unbelievably difficult, but it's the biggest trick of the Itzahara. Not only are you going to have pain from what, from any disappointment you have in your children, but I'm also going to tack that onto you. I'm going to take my long nails and just scratch them right into you and drain you of confidence. Not at all. Yeah. I think that what the Rebbe is saying here, and this could apply to children or anything good that you could look at in your life, anything, hold on to it, grab onto it, let it empower you. Don't be like, oh, that was a blip, whatever. I probably had nothing to do with that anyways. Anything good, hold on to. And anything bad, it's an isayom. If there is an opportunity to sit down with a mashpia or a therapist and say, you know, this is something that could be improved going forward, maybe that and only that could be in a constructive time to take blame for something that a child is going through. But even that, who knows? Who knows the mystery of the universe. And we know that there's certainly not any set formula. If you'd like this, your children will be like this. So anything that's coming to make us feel disempowered is coming from the Itzahara. 
hundred percent. If it's disempowering you, it's for sure the eighth Sahara. I, I'm wondering like this though, somebody else asked that in the beginning, you spoke about really painful, shameful situations that really are not your shame to carry. Like it's not your shame to carry. If there's someone with mental illness that did something, you know, whether it was the suicide or the murder, that's not your shame. But what about when you feel like you are doing something that you would think is your shame and you're not even ready to let it go. Let's say you have that addiction or that struggle and it's current. It's not someone else's and it's not even yours from the past but it's yours currently how then do you not fall prey to that yitzhara who who says it's who says that's yours to own who says that wasn't something that you were born with that maybe you were inherited from another gilgal a chemical makeup that you had that makes a person more prone to addiction something that you inherited who knows it's very hard for us to sit and say this was 100% my choice, and this is not. Even things that are our choice, and definitely things that are our struggles, are things that are packaged that the Abishter gives us. And there is a lot of room to feel compassion for the fact that this is a struggle that I have. It's more clear cut, maybe, when it's a family member who committed suicide, and it's not, it's not a choice that I made or a struggle that I have. But, and when you have a struggle, that was, you chose to have that struggle? Not at all. That's also something the Abishter gave you. In fact, so much so, and I'm sure, Sarah, I know that you um, have taught and I think auth authored a book on Tanya, right? Yeah. That's one thing that I find, and tell me if you, um, if you agree, that when it comes to the end of Parakhav Zayin, Chavav, where the Alter Abba talks about mistakes that you've made, he does say that there is a limited time for Mariros. Again, maybe in Darashvi, not so much. I don't know. But when it comes to Per Zayin and Chavchef, where it talks about your internal struggles, there is no time. There is no set time for Mariros. Right. Let it go. The shameful thoughts, the feelings. Right, and not even that. Shame comes from your ego. You think you're so great that you don't struggle with the rest, the rest of humanity struggles. It's like it turns it completely on its head. Um, and, and the and language that the altar yeah. uses, that it falls into your mind, these here right. right. I and mean, if that's not describing something that was um, a challenge that was given to you on a silver platter, that's not your choice or doing... I don't know what is. So I don't think that it's really that different. Right. It's almost like counterintuitive. Like you would think that the guilt and the shame, pardon the July 4th fireworks, would motivate you to do better. And we're coming and saying, no, it's part of a vicious cycle that will get you worse. Like the wording of the Alter Rebbe is, be a dua. It is for sure. This is a trick of the Yetzirah because the Yetzirah wants you depressed. The Yetzirah wants you down and guilty and full of shame because when you're in that mode, you need something to make you feel better and you're more prone to whatever it is that you were previously prone to. So it's a vicious cycle. So as counterintuitive as it sounds, if you find yourself struggling, choose joy because that will put you in a better place and give you more of an ability to fight those demons that you're struggling with and if you're beating yourself up. I'm um, okay. Somebody just shared that somebody once lamented to the Rebbe that they weren't a child straight. It must be my fault because the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And the Rebbe said that might be true in normal times, but not with the winds blow strong. And now the winds are blowing very strong. So I guess that's the Rebbe's approach to the other questioner about that. It's true. Today, you could be, have the most year Shemaim and do the best that you can. And there are so many challenges today that it, you know, it doesn't reflect on you. Um, and the rabbi acknowledges the challenges generation. So thank you. I love when it becomes interactive and a for ring and like Rachel, you shared so beautifully, but people are really um, messaging how beautifully you described it, how much, how much you really, really touch them um, without being, okay. So I think the last question was, um, sorry, I just see one more coming in. Uh, somebody asked where you could find the letter. Rachel posted in the beginning of the chat. If you join the chat later, Rachel, can you repost it so she could see it? I will repost it. And you can also find it on um, Shay's Taub's website, uh, Soul Words, and on Orba Holmes' website, 30 Letters, 30 Days. And uh, you can also listen to Rabbi Shay's Taub explaining it. He takes it in a different direction. 
uh, but in an amazing, he explains it in an amazing way along with other letters. Okay, a few more questions came in. One is, what do you think we could do amongst each other to make, to lessen that shame and pain? Like if it's so normal, if struggle is so universal, why is it that we're all feeling so ashamed of our, of our challenges? Like how can we normalize it to each other? Not, not, I'm going to add this part, normalize it in the positive so that we can grow, not normalize it. So, Hey, there's no shame anymore. We may as well give in to our, our challenges, but more like normalizing it to encourage each other. I think that, you know, it's the, the reason that we may feel guilty or ashamed is so personal and so different. Like I said, a lot of times I'll wake up in the morning and I'll just feel like, oh, I, I feel I did something so wrong and I don't even know what it is. It's like the Yitzhahara just automatically downloads, like you're not good enough at 6 a.m. before I even did anything. <laughs> um, so and then, of course, there's there's the triggers, there's the things that we feel like we're not good enough because of. And for everybody, it's, you know, for everybody, it's personal. So I think the first step is, like you're saying, Sarah, to say, okay, that's my normal go-to is to let that drain me today or, or this week or every day. But what is the Rebbe's approach? And how can I push back on this even a little bit? Maybe I'm not going to feel super confident today. Maybe I'm not going to feel super happy today. But if, even if I could challenge that, that, that monster, that demon that's coming to make me feel less than and weak today, a little bit by recognizing, okay, this is the Eitzahara, by recognizing, you know, even though I feel this way, the Rebbe still believes in me. The Rebbe still wants me to have a great day. And the Rebbe said that the Rebbe finds reasons to, to understand why I made a mistake or why I have this struggle. And if that changes things, shifts things, even a little bit, like opening the window of a dark room, a crack to let in one stream of light, that's, to me, mission accomplished. That's huge. So that's, I think, where it starts as well. In terms of uh, a community and giving support for each other, I think that it's, uh, for me, and please share if anybody else has other ideas, for me, it is about trying to put on the Rebbe's glasses when looking at another person that I would judge. And I would feel like I don't have to advocate for them. I don't have to be Malamed's host for them. But that's, that's not the Rebbe's approach. I need to be the Rebbe's shlucha. I need to carry that message and embody that attitude to whatever degree I could to this person. So therefore, right now, I, am a, I can do the best job by being a safe space for this person, by trying to think about where this person is succeeding and what may be contributing to their challenges and to show them that I'm there to help them in whatever way that I could. And this could be a, a child, a friend, a spouse, a student, a camper. Um, I think that that can go, could be very challenging, but can, can really go a long way in giving people support and normalizing struggle. But Sarah, if there's something else um, that comes to your mind, I'd love to hear. Yeah. You know, I don't, I think people take it to the other extreme and think that everybody has to openly share all their issues in public in order to achieve this um, sense of, of normal, you know, normalizing things and vulnerability. And I think there's somewhat of like a balance where it's like, you don't have to share it with everybody, but you need to have your people, you know, we need to have our friends. You need to have friends who know really what's going on. And, you know, Jesse Jacobson, I've heard him say, Rabbi Jacobson say, you know, there's two types of people, people with problems and people I don't know. You know, anybody, you know, Hashem has given them their custom made challenges and situation. And we don't need to know everyone's challenges. I don't need to know everyone on the Zoom's challenges, but I need to have enough people in my life that will also encourage me in the way I want to be encouraged. You know, they say, even if you're sharing something that is something in your marriage, share it with a marriage minded friend, you know, like share whatever struggles you do have in the context of the people that will lift you up in the direction that you want to go. 
somebody said in the comments, talk about it. Shame can only exist when we hide it and keep it quiet. Yeah. I do think it's not healthy to have secrets. I do agree that we need to shed light on the shame. It doesn't need to be in front of 3 million people, um, but there needs to be people, family, friends, mashpia, that we are fully, fully, fully honest. Somebody says, encourage learning of chitas because it brings joy and contentment and his gosh for us. I love the for bringing Rachel. People are pushing for bringing with us. Thank you for making this for bringing. I'm so glad to join. Tell me if you want to tackle this. It sounds like all these words, you ready, Rachel? Sounds like these words, unconditional love and safe space are just modern buzzwords. Is this really authentic Hasidic approach? Mm. <laughs> well, I would say you tell me. What do you think that the Rebbe is describing as the role of a Rebbe? Um, maybe the modern world is catching up to what always existed in a Rebbe Hasid relationship that the Rebbe is writing 72 years ago. Mm -hmm. You are beating yourself up. I want you to know the way I look at you. I know your flaws. The Rebbe knows everybody's flaws and he's still committed to benching them and telling the Abishter why their flaws are not really so bad. So you tell me, what is that? I, maybe I'm using, maybe I am guilty of using uh, a, a new age word. Maybe you have a better word, but what picture is that in your mind? I think that's what's important here. The Rebbe is going through effort, taking time and writing down in such descriptive graphic way, the way the Rebbe looks at this woman and everybody. The Rebbe wants that to be firmly placed in her mind. So whatever word you wanna to use to hold that picture tight in your mind and heart, go for it. Beautiful, beautiful. I love how you said that, how they're catching up to the Rebbe. Um, somebody else was so touched about your story with the curtain underscores one of the Rebbe's most emphatic messages to us that he stressed in so many situations that the action we take spiritually affect the world physically. Beautifully. Somebody's asking if we could give an example or an idea of something practical we can do to internalize this letter. In other words, we spoke a lot. So therefore, I, I think you touched on it before because you said when you wake up in the morning, just recognize that that negative voice isn't you. But, but can you still encapsulate these ideas in, in, in a practical way? I think for me, and maybe I've been overly influenced by Orvachoim, but uh, learning the Rebbe's letters, it shifts the way you think. Hmm. And, you know, after you learn a letter like this, how can you go about your day having these negative labels that you put on your forehead? and feel complacent with them. The Rev has took so much time to shake, the, to shake up this woman and redirect her and re-energize her. So you just don't feel comfortable with it anymore. And every letter in a different way is giving, is giving you the Rebbe's way of looking at things, the Rebbe's Weltanschaft, the Rebbe's perspective on so many areas um, and, um, I, I think that that could be a practical takeaway that periodically as often as you have time for in your life to learn the Rebbe's letters. And for those of you who haven't listened to Rabbi Shea's Taub's 30 letters, 30 days, or this series, um, it makes it riveting, you know, <laughs> it's like, you don't want to, you don't want to turn it off. And um, I also, some of the letters, like for example, he did the letter to Reb Shleimah Chaim Kesselman. That was the first letter he did. And it was, I listened to it and I said, okay, that's the Rebbe's boot camp. That is unbelievable. The way the Rebbe, again, before the Rebbe, this is when the Frida Krebbe was still alive, the way the Rebbe spells out what he wants from a chassid is unbelievable. So yes, so I, I think that that could be a practical takeaway after we just spent an hour plus learning a letter from the Rebbe to keep going, keep learning letters from the Rebbe. They're, they change your life. Wow, wow, I see it all over your face, you're glowing. 
Thank you so, so much, Rachel. This was an absolute joy. It's unbelievable how we're able to use technology and have a real for bringing. I'm just imagining us around the table. And the truth is, this is also part of the answer. The question before was how to create a place where we're able to be open. It's by having real for bringings with each other, where we learn what the Rebbe says and we're real about it and we're honest and um, I see more questions are coming in. We'll have to have another for bringing at some other point. Thank you so much, Rachel, for your time. Um, yeah, Rachel, are you open you. if anyone wants to reach out to you by email or something? Do you want to put your email in the chat or something? Sure. I'll put my email in the chat right now. I just see somebody taking adding more questions. Um, somebody adds they every night three things that she did that was hard and she compliments herself. Nice. Nice. Building yourself up. Um, so if you have more questions for Rachel, feel free to email her. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining this Beis Rifka alumna event and to whoever else that is Mitzarif and joins the Beis Rifka family by hopping on. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Sara, for inviting me effort. to, yeah. to your, uh, your, such a tremendous powerhouse. Hashem should continue to bench you with the Koyach in the way that you do and more. Amen. And may we really experience a Geula Prati, personal redemption from these letters, and that will really usher in the ultimate Geula Klali for all of us. And that's a bracha for everybody. Thank you so, so, so much. Amen.